and if anyone wasn't able to, thank you. <laughs> and if anyone wasn't able to attend today, um, you can also share that with them as well so that they can have this as a resource um, and review it. Okay, um, so we will also be saving questions until after our presenters are done. So um, we'll let them go ahead and go through their slideshow. And then after that, if there are any questions, we will be open to taking those. Um, so without further ado, um, we are, like I said, we're super excited about this topic. This is something we've had interest in on the circle for a while. Um, the topic of delivering mental health services in conflict areas and how to actually do that, what that looks like. Um, so we're very excited about this. Our speakers today um, delivering this presentation are Aliana Jarismova. Hopefully I didn't butcher that too much on the last name. Apologies for my Southern accent. She is the Chief of Party um, for USAID Public Health Systems and Recovery and Resilience Activity. And she's also the Country Director uh, in Ukraine for PACT. So we are happy to have her here. Just a short intro um, about Aliana. She holds a master's degree in education. She's a Ukrainian citizen with over 25 years of experience in international development projects, through which she's gained a deep understanding of local and national issues and ways of engaging citizens, strengthening governmental policy and service delivery, and collaborating with the private sector to increase social impact. She led and oversaw program implementation in areas such as health and social services, child welfare and vulnerable children services, and she was honored with the Ukrainian President's Award in 2008 by the Ministry of Family, Youth and Sports in uh, 2008 and by the Ministry of Family and Youth, um, sorry. Sorry about that. <laughs> um, she also leads the implementation of BACPAC's Global Affairs Canada funded women's empowerment gender equality program in Ukraine. So we will also share all of this information out um, and have this available to you if you want more information on any of our speakers. Um, our other speaker is Shirley Cow from, um, she's the Senior Director of Global Health at PACT. So just to give a brief um, bio on her, she is the Director of Global Health. Um, let's see, she provides um, technical assistance to her team. She's a public health specialist with more than 18 years of experience. Um, she's worked, I believe, in more than 15 countries um, across Africa, Eastern Europe, and Asia, and she has um, ex expertise in results-based project design and implementation. Um, prior to, to joining PACT, she led um, USAID and PEPFAR-funded comprehensive programming for HIV and AIDS prevention initiatives, um, and she also helped with HIV programming for F FHI 360 in Mozambique. So we are very excited to have these speakers here. Um, they have a lot of expertise and knowledge about these topics, and we're just really excited to go ahead and jump in. So without further ado, um, I will stop talking. <laughs> I'll take a step backwards and go ahead and let our speakers um, take it over. So let me go ahead and get our presentation shared here. Oh, thanks so much for the intro, Holly. Um, greetings to everyone. Um, good morning, good afternoon, good evening, wherever you might be logging in from. Um, I, can you hear me okay? Yes, I can hear just fine. Okay, great. Um, just a quick note. I think um, Aliona has dropped off. Um, mm -hmm. She is um, tuning in from from Kiev, and she, I just got a note from her saying that she lost her internet connection, but she is trying to get back on via mobile. Um, but I think mobile connection. But I think you know while we're waiting for her to get back on, um, I'm happy to get us started. Um, but just wanted to Thank alert you. That. Yeah. Um, so I think if we could also ask, so kindly you ask you if you're not speaking to please mute, that would be Sorry, really helpful. Thank you. Yes, if everyone can please stay muted right now, that would be wonderful. 
Thank you. Thank you. Well, first, just to start off, um, I do want to thank you, Holly, you know, as PAC colleague, for inviting us to present to this comms working group of the Global Mental Health Action Network. We have certainly heard about you. Um, we're really pleased to be here. I'm pleased to be here, especially with my co-presenter, Aliona, who we hope will be back online soon. I'm going to start off with a high-level overview of our public health um, systems recovery and resilience project and how we are addressing mental health and psychosocial support programming. And then I will hand it over to Aliona, and she is going to talk more about the component of communications um, that we're implementing as part of our mental health and psychosocial support programming. Uh, next slide, please. Thank you. So, so the USAID Public Health System Recovery and Resilience Activity, we call it PHSRNR for short. Um, this is a five-year USAID funded project. Um, it actually started um, May 2022. So just three months, two, two, two to three months after the war had started in Ukraine. Um, this is actually um, a public health focused project. It's, it's a very unique project in the sense that we are um, working very closely with the government of Ukraine um, in terms of, you know, they're undergoing public health reform now, uh, working to modernize our public health system. And so the overarching goal of this project is to work with the government in Ukraine, um, increase their capacity to prevent, detect, and respond to public health threats, sustain critical public health services during a crisis, um, protect the health of all Ukrainians, including vulnerable and marginalized populations. And then um, the, the fourth, but you know, increasingly important piece is increasing access to mental health and psychosocial support for war impacted populations. So just something about our project is that we are addressing mental health within the lens or the framework of public health system strengthening. Um, and this is something that we, we keep in mind um, as we um, have been um, adapting, developing, adapting and implementing um, our mental health work. Um, and we are very much, you know, in, in a very um, dynamic, um, uncertain context in Ukraine at the moment. So there's, there's a lot of learning by doing that, um, uh, that we're relying on as, as we implement um, our work. Uh, next slide, please. So just some data, some numbers here to just give you context. Um, and I think uh, some of these are familiar to many of you um, of the impact of this unprovoked um, war on Ukraine. Um, it has been nearly two years. We're just two years shy of the two-year mark um, of this um, unprovoked war against um, Ukraine. And what that has resulted in is um, 6.3 million people who have fled the country. Um, and you know, this includes women and children fled the country who have left, you know, their husbands and partners behind. Um, this includes elderly um, and, and the most vulnerable. Um, and um, this has also created nearly 5 million people who are internally displaced, um, who have a number of unique challenges, um, a lot of displacement from the east of the country to the west of the country. There are about 1.2 million veterans and families, um, including those who are currently receiving various kinds of um, government support. Um, this number of um, veterans is expected to increase to about four to five million. Um, and then there are about 1.2 million Ukrainians who live in Russian occupied areas. Um, in addition, over 10,000 civilians have been killed, nearly 20,000 wounded, and over 26,000 missing individuals um, whose families are living in the space of not knowing um, where their loved ones are, um, and as well as um, over 4,000 individuals who are in cap captivity, um, and about 25% of those are civilians. Um, these numbers here are not exact numbers, they're, they're estimates, but it indicates, you know, just uh, the great impact that the war has had um, on Ukrainian populations. Um, and also, it's it's in a way an indicator as well of um, that as the war continues, uh, mental health um, and psychosocial support needs are also increasing. So we very much see uh, mental health and psychosocial support as a critical public health service um, to be supported and strengthened um, in Ukraine. Next slide, please.
Next slide. I'm trying, sorry. Okay, that's okay. <laughs> There we go. Okay. So this um, is just meant to show you just, you know, in, in a very simple way, kind of the, the main components of our mental health psychosocial support program within the PHS r, &R project. Mm -hmm. um, we are not a just a humanitarian organization. Um, we as PACT, um, we're the lead implementer for this project. Um, we're very much uh, a development organization and we um, pay a lot of attention to ensuring that everything that we do, that the sustainability is built in from the very beginning. So service provision, direct service provision is a big part of what we're doing. Um, and within the service provision is where the communication piece comes in uh, to address, um, you know, stigma um, against mental health and mental health conditions. I think, you know, we know stigma is a pervasive issue globally. Um, it, is, it is a significant barrier for people to access um, mental health and psychosocial support services. Um, also, that we have efforts to normalize um, discussion and conversation around mental health. Um, everything that we do within this um, is in to ensure that we are building the capacity of um, local systems, um, local and national systems, and that includes building the capacity of um, local uh, service providers in mental health and psychosocial support, as well as organizations and the government in, in being able to plan and implement and monitor mental health and psychosocial support programming. Um, this is all in case within a systems strengthening approach. Um, you know, all of our service provision is implemented within the context of the systems um, that individuals and communities um, operate and live in. And this includes not just the public health systems, which is very much our focus, but also it intersects with um, the health system, as well as the social support system. Um, and then we're also getting involved um, in the ed education sector. Um, and Aliona will touch on that a little bit more. And then ensuring that there's that with everything that we're doing, that we're pushing forth technical leadership. Um, I uh, mentioned earlier that we're doing a lot you know, learning by doing. Um, so we um, have um, efforts to ensure that we, as we implement and um, test and contextualize different mental health uh, services and interventions to the Ukraine context that we are um, having good data in place um, to look at the impact and effects of our mental health service interventions, that we are documenting them um, and that these interventions and this programming can be supported for um, further scale up in the future and that you know part of the legacy of the project is having um, uh, thought leadership um, materials um, implementation manuals and such in place um, for ongoing implementation of mental health and psychosocial support um, services beyond the project. Uh, next slide please. So in terms of our activities, so we are working at different levels of the public health system in Ukraine. Um, we are at the national level, at the regional and, and local level. Um, at the national level, we're supporting direct provision of in-person, online, and hybrid um, mental health and psychosocial support services. This is to address immediate needs, um, working alongside a number of different partners, as well as existing service providers. Um, and so this is really about you know, where the need is greatest. Um, again, um, system strengthening, um, this is a focus of our work in terms of helping Ukraine to have a comprehensive and modern mental health and psychosocial support system. And one um, key component of our work here is around workforce development, is ensuring there are pipelines of um, trained and competent um, mental health and psychosocial service providers, um, including, you know, this is from Lay, lay providers to um, nurses and social workers. We're not so much at the higher level of, you know, medical mental health or um, where we're intervening is much more at the lower intensity and the community-based um, uh, mental health service provision. And then also within this, as we're also um, working to increase access and availability of services, you know, there is, uh, we are paying attention as well to ensuring that there are efforts to enhance demand for and increase um, in uptake of mental health um, care services. At the regional and local levels, um, and this is where we're able to um, implement activities um, 
deeper on the ground at community level. We do have currently about eight focus regions in Ukraine, as well as, you know, focused territorial communities where we are working to develop and text test and contextualize um, community-led models for mental health um, psychosocial support service provision. This is based on local needs um, and priorities um, and informed by assessments that we have done in country. Um, and then our project, um, even at, at the local level um, and also extending to the national level, we do, um, you know, feature of our project is to maintain this program flexibility. Again, we're working, operating in a very uncertain di and dynamic environment. So the, you know, it's very much a thrust of our project to extend direct support to regions um, where uh, vulnerabilities and, and needs are most acute. Uh, next slide, please. Um, a little bit more about our national level activities. So we do work very closely with the First Ladies, um, Elena Zelenska's her office. Um, her office's signature initiative is the All Ukrainian Mental Health Program, um, and they have been implementing um, a national communications campaign called How Are You? And Aliona will talk more about that. Uh, also, we've worked with them to uh, conduct an assessment of mental health needs and resources that are available. Um, again, with our um, nationwide coverage, um, we're doing a lot in terms of increasing access to evidence-informed um, mental health interventions, um, specifically trauma-focused cognitive behavioral therapy. And this is through subgrants that um, we have with existing provider organizations. Um, there are online platforms that we have been supporting to facilitate access to psycho psychological counseling. Um, and for a lot of people, this is the preferable way to access mental health and psychosocial support. We're also increasing our work with veteran services, um, you know, recognizing that um, the number of demobilized vet veterans will be increasing over time. So there is work that we are um, expanding through with um, national partner organizations to um, increase and expand the work of veteran spaces. <clears throat> Excuse me. Hold on one second. excuse me, <clears throat> uh, veteran spaces to provide <clears throat> mental health as well as um, other social support services to veterans. And then finally, the workforce development. This is where um, we have um, work that is ramping up together with um, U.S.-based partners who are listed here to work with Ukrainian training institutions to enhance um, programs, um, training programs for nurses, social workers, psychologists, uh, lay and peer counselors. Next slide, please. Um, at the local community uh, level, so we have focused a lot on ensuring that the services that we support are evidence-informed interventions, um, including those that are endorsed by WHO, the um, MH gap um, that is provided through primary care providers or primary care facilities, um, self-help plus, um, also other evidence-informed interventions such as um, the common elements treatment approach known as CETA by Johns Hopkins, um, as well as mind-body medicine, which is more um, group-based psychosocial counseling um, that is being supported by the U.S.-based Center for Mind-Body Medicine. Um, so the idea here is to have a, um, like a menu of different um, evidence-informed mental health interventions that address different needs that individuals may have for support, and also um, you know how they would prefer to receive services, whether, you know, it's through health workers, uh, social workers, psychologists, teachers, and educators, um, and or peers and, and community-based lay counselors. We are also um, supporting um, the provision of these services through a range of different venues and a lot of this, again, it's, it's um, to address that, you know, people have different access to different venues and facilities as preference as well. Um, so these include, um, our venues include um, primary health care facilities, um, centers for social services, veteran spaces, um, hospitals, schools, and CSOs. In terms of um, our key results to date, um, 
uh, we have in 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 where we are doing um, in depth community work um, at the territorial community level. We have um, following WHO's MHGAP methodology. We have mapped all the available mental health services that are existing already in communities. Um, to identify, you know, what are existing venues that can be leveraged, but also to identify gaps, as well as how the services can be connected to each other. Um, we have also conducted um, a community health needs assessment that was, you know, included mental health, but was um, about um, overall public health needs and it really gave us insights in terms of, um, you know, what people see as their most, you know, important um, health priorities during this time, um, as well as um, barriers that they face in accessing services services. Uh, to date, up until January 31st of this year, we've trained about um, 3,000 providers across the different evidence-based interventions listed here. And also, we have supported um, 14,500, um, uh, please forgive the error here with the extra, extra zero, but 14,500 individuals have received um, mental health and psychosocial support services through um, 13 local partners that we are collaborating with. Um, and also, as part of this, we have been working very closely with community based local partners in terms of like what what is a good model for um, delivering mental health services that is community and client centered that addresses not only individual needs, but also supports community healing and resilience. And um, we have co-created a concept with local partners called um, taking care of yourself or taking care of oneself. Um, this is, you know, um, a physical space where um, individuals can ex access a different variety of uh, mental health interventions. Um, and we're currently in the process of launching and rolling this out. And Aliona will talk a little bit more about this too. So I think that wraps up my high level overview of um, our PHS r, &R project and what we're doing in mental health and psychosocial support programming. I will not hand it over to Aliona, who is back on um, to talk about the communications piece. Thank you and over to you, Aliona. Thank you, Shirley, and greetings, everyone. Uh, happy to, to be here. Thank you for inviting us. And next slide, please. So I'll talk a bit more specifically about our communications efforts. As Shirley has mentioned, we are working closely with the First Lady of Ukraine Initiative on all Ukrainian mental health program. And part of it, and this is really a signature initiative of the First Lady, is the communication campaign, How Are You? Uh, the whole idea of the campaign um, is to promote um, and to nurture the culture of mental health care and well-being and to destigmatize um, mental health challenges. Historically in Ukraine, probably like many other countries, mental health has been placed within specialized psychiatric institutions, and there's been a lot of stigma around it. Um, given the, the context in Ukraine today and the war that we've been living through in the last two years, mental health needs have been increasing tremendously, and uh, the culture of seeking help um, was not here. Um, so the um, the goal, as I said, is to promote and basically um, create this culture of looking for help. The key messages um, have been built about things like it's normal to talk about your mental health needs and challenges. Um, you really need to take care of yourself. You can learn self-help skills uh, and you can help yourself. But at the same time, do not be afraid to ask for help and to seek more professional uh, MHPSS services. Uh, we've been supporting this campaign for the past six months, I believe. Um, and the expected results is that Ukrainians uh, have the skills and practice self-help skills, and also that the demand uh, for services increases and uh, there is an increased uptake of the services. Next slide, please. 
um the the campaign itself um is really uh like national level and, and very very big uh using multiple channels and approaches there's been a lot um uh, through mass media and social media in particular uh there is a podcast series that has become very popular and it engages uh ukrainian as well as international um experts as well as people people uh, with lived experiences. Uh, there are educational series of short readers and digital education. Um, the, there is a landing uh, page with a lot of uh, helpful hints and lots of content uh, on the one hand about self-help tools and techniques, on the other hand with additional information where people can uh, look for services, whether that's like a hotline, of practicing psychologists or psychotherapists, um, lots of public service announcements, uh, outdoor advertising. Uh, it's really a remarkable. Uh, it's really remarkable that the public sector has been uh, very proactive and very engaged in this whole initiative. Because you could see all the PSAs, etc., uh, on the railway, like in the banks, supermarkets, gas stations, uh, they've really partnered uh, to promote this idea. Um, also, the <clears throat> there were multiple community-based events, uh, which were like more uh, participatory and engaging. Um, what Ukraine uh, is uh, probably known for. Uh, is the the digital solutions and there is a, a digital digital platform that is used basically by every Ukrainian. It's called Dia, and it's as our president once said, a country in a smartphone. But basically, all administrative services or any kind of uh, public services you can access through that online platform Dia, uh, and now. The, the mental health uh, resources have been integrated into the single portal of government uh, services. Uh, also, the initiative has engaged celebrities um, uh, who've been promoting the idea of not only taking care of yourself and your close ones, but also um, encouraging people to look for uh, services. Next slide, please. Um, and uh, at the same time, one of the things that uh, we realized is that um, in order to uh, destigmatize uh, the whole idea of mental health services and um, to increase the, the uptake of services, you really need to make services available. And this is how we came up with this idea of taking care of myself spaces that Shirley has mentioned. It's really um, a product of co-creation with our local partners. And the idea is to bring several services under the same roof the venue can be very different. It depends on the territorial community. Um, and the idea is that it can be a school, a center for social services, a CSO, a primary care clinic, a library in a village, uh, whatever venue is easy accessible and people will go to. And the space provides a combination of services, individual counseling by professional psychologists, as well as group sessions to learn self-care techniques and peer support, and also online access to high-level interventions uh, by professional uh, psychotherapists. We are launching a network of such spaces across Ukraine. We have opened one so far and we'll be launching eight more next month. Um, so hopefully uh, this will also help um, not only to destigmatize uh, services, um, but bring services closer to people. Next slide. And even though we've been uh, working in this space for uh, not for so long, uh, there are some lessons learned and recommendations which we're happy to share with you today. Uh, one is that mental health needs uh, need to be part of routine communications um, 
including all kinds of public health communications. It shouldn't be a standalone uh, communication campaign. It really needs to be integrated. Um, promoting a culture of mental health requires a whole of society approach. Again, it's much broader than just health sector. Um, uh, these messages need to be like mutually reinforced, reinforced and need to, to be across uh, sectors. Uh, we need to be careful when we increase demand because we don't want to increase demand when there is no supply. So there, we really need to be careful to balance between like demand and supply um, to make sure that uh, we can meet the needs. And also destigmatizing mental health requires more than just talking about it. We really need to create spaces uh, which provide uh, people-centered, safe, respectful, and non-judgmental environment. Uh, and this is probably the best communication technique uh, and the, the best communication approach. This is where we are, and we'll be happy to, to answer any, any questions. There is a final slide that says questions. <laughs> There it, <laughs> there it is. There it is. Thank you. <laughs> um, all right. Let me just stop sharing right now so that we can open this up for discussion. Um, thank you so much, Aliana and Shirley, for this wonderful presentation. This was super informative, super helpful. Um, I really enjoyed sort of the lessons learned here um, and recommendations. I thought that's super helpful. So thank you for including that. Um, Let's see. So what questions do we have? Um, I will try to look through and see if anyone has their hand up. Um, but also I'll look in the chat right now as well, just to see if there's anything. Um, and Faith and Deborah, if you want to help me with that as well, if you see any questions, feel free to, to jump in. Let's see here. Well, What was that? We have two hands up uh, right now. Sorry, Basically, you're... Salvador. I Fabian see one up. right here. See one. Hi. Oh, go ahead. I see a hand up. Uh, go ahead, Feline. Uh, hi, <laughs> I'm from the Philippines and I am, uh, I'm lucky how I found this uh, webinar. It's been very insightful and um, I was wondering whether um, you tailored your MHPSS interventions towards the specific needs of the people in Ukraine and whether there was space for um, co-development, like um, assessing where their needs are and then um, like tailoring whatever, because usually um, we get the um, content from the WHO, but um, I wonder if you did anything to like um, specifically um, tailor Thank you. Thank you so much. Uh, this is a great question. And this is exactly how the How Are You campaign has been implemented in so-called waves, like targeted communications for specific population groups. As of now, there's been uh, just several waves. Uh, one is specifically for children and adolescents. One was um, uh, targeting uh, actually primary care providers. Uh, and it was called like help those who help others. Um, and now there is one uh, targeting veterans and their families, um, but it hasn't been out yet. And um, while working uh, on messaging them on the messages themselves, I know that they they've been like uh, focus group discussions and uh, those who were targeted with the messages were also engaged in tailoring the messages. Yes. That's good to hear. Um, I'm very curious in the actual process of um, doing that. Like, how did you actually do it? Because it's one way to say that we did focus groups, but I was wondering, because it seems to have been very effective. So I was wondering, like, um, how did you do it? <laughs> how did it become so successful? 
We we are, we are not doing it directly. We are supporting the efforts uh, of the First Lady's office. They do have their own project implementation unit. Uh, so they are kind of uh, driving the process. Uh, I mean, we can maybe, surely maybe we can talk to them and holy, and if there is interest, we can probably do another webinar and invite uh, those people who are doing that directly. Oh, that'd be great. Thank you. I'd appreciate that. Great, thank you for that. I see another hand up, um, Felicity. Hello, uh, yes, thank you, Holly, and many thanks to Aliana and Shirley for the presentation. Um, I'm uh, an MHPSS director for an NGO called Humanity Crew. We're exclusively on MHPSS, and I myself have worked in Ukraine from 2015 to 2017. Um, with regards to the monitoring and evaluation of the activities that you're implementing, in terms of how they inform adaptive programming, but also just to look at impact over the course of your interventions. Uh, how is that being operationalized? Because that's always a bit of a challenge. Over. That's a very good question. We are working together with our donor, USAID, on the development of the like monitor and evaluation framework. Uh, again, we're just starting launching the services. As of now, we've been responding to, to immediate needs um, through subgrants to existing providers. We're also launching new services or new formats for service delivery. We plan to do like an implementation science piece to actually look into implementation and see uh, they look into the effectiveness, et cetera. Um, Shirley, if you want to pick it up from here. Yeah, um, yeah, just to say this is very much, um, thanks for that question, Felicity. This is very much a work in progress. I, right now, um, we a lot of the monitoring is what we call more Output based, right? Like number of people who we number of people who received services. Um, some specific interventions have a little bit more outcome based um, measurement, where you know you have follow up. You know, you know once um, an individual or a group has finished, you know the intervention itself. You know the follow up in terms of you know what are their symptoms with regard to anxiety, stress, sleep disturbances, etc. Using different scales. Um, follow up um, at different intervals. Um, the our project is still very much in terms of the rollout of the mental health piece. It's still very much in early stages, but this is something that is a work in progress. The ME piece, and um, as Aliona uh, mentioned, we are working very closely with USAID to ensure that we're very we're aligned um, with their um, uh, overall guidance on this. Great, thank you for that, Shirley. Um, okay, we're going to take a couple questions from the chat now. Um, so the first question that I see is from Andres Martinez. It's, have you engaged religious actors in your efforts? And if so, can you tell us a bit about that? We have not yet, uh, but there's been some discussion um, because this is, again, uh, not a very straightforward kind of thing. Uh, depending on the religious groups, they can be either supportive or um, the 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 opposite. We actually one of our local uh, sub grantees um, who work with the families and children um, who were evacuated um, from occupied areas. Um, they are a faith-based organization. So as of now, this is about as much as our engagement is. Um, but but we are looking into uh, maybe partnering closer uh, with religious groups. Okay, thank you for that, Aliana. Um, our next question is from Protus Yabunga. Um, they said, thank you for the presentation. My question is, how has the SH plus been received and are there any modifications which you did to them? Uh, we have not done any modification to self-help plus on its own because that's a WHO intervention. Uh, we um, uh, introduced self-help plus as an intervention for health providers, first of all, because health providers are under a lot of pressure as well. So we build the capacity 
of hospital staff to facilitate uh, SH plus groups, uh, but we're also introducing that as one of the interventions within our taking care of yourself uh, spaces. Um, so far, the feedback uh, has been quite positive. Uh, the mind-body medicine intervention that Shirley um, presented earlier is uh, also similar to Self-Help Plus. It provides a bit more space for like interaction uh, because that's like the, there is a lot of interaction between uh, group members, uh, but basically the, the approach is pretty similar. All right. Um, the next one is from Natalie Thomas. She asked, I was wondering if these provisions and programs are open to non-Ukrainians still stuck in Ukraine or if they are for Ukrainians only. And everyone uh, in Ukraine uh, can access these services. Great answer. That's good. <laughs> um, the next one is from Dr. Spirit Clanton. Um, the question is, do you think these, any and all of these interventions could be beneficial for other populations currently or previously experiencing similar lived experiences? Would there be any recommendations that you might suggest based on limitations noted as part of your current findings? It's really sad we're very early in the implementation. I'm sure there will be a lot of learning. And uh, one thing we can promise is that we'll be sharing our, all of our learnings uh, broadly. And I'm sure that the, the experience from Ukraine and the lived experiences uh, can definitely be of interest uh, for others. I wish we didn't have that experience to share, but unfortunately we do. So whatever we learn, I hope others will benefit from it, yeah. Great, we're just gonna take one more question because I know we have to save time for uh, member updates. I see one more, um, I, I thought I did. <laughs> Perhaps that person I dropped it. hand down because <laughs> maybe you didn't have time. <laughs> Oh, no, it's okay. I think you can actually be our last question. It looks like there's no more in the chat. So you can be our final one. We'll wrap it up. Um, um, sorry, I forgot. But oh, yeah. Um, um, how do you measure well being in a space where there's such a, it's such an emergency context? Like, how do you like, because we know there's value in monitoring and evaluation and collecting the data, but given that we're in a space where um, it's sort of like an emergency and the conflict is all around, like how do you balance that um, um, uh, thing? Yeah, thanks. Uh, I'm not sure uh, I am completely clear on the question. Like, um, uh, um, because we do monitor and evaluation for our MHPSS activities, right? So um, I wonder how your data the collection works. Like, um, because sometimes um, people forget to collect, like, to collect that data. Like, because um, you're in an emergency, maybe there's someone getting shot out there. Um, you're in the middle of doing, mm -hmm. like, you know, you're in you're in a war, right? So um. How do right. you ensure that you're able to collect that data while being in that emergency mm -hmm. sort of context? I mean, we, we are not really like a humanitarian response organization. Uh, so we're not doing like emergency uh, response or humanitarian response. Yes, okay. Ukraine has been in the war for the last two years. Uh, it's our new normality, unfortunately. So we, we, we do operate uh, in this new normality uh, we do collect data, we do enter data in the computer. Uh, I mean, I don't know what the secret is for Ukrainian resilience. <laughs> I keep saying it again and again. Uh, but somehow we, we do our best to keep on with our lives, taking care of ourselves and helping others. <laughs> that, that's very good to hear. Like, uh, there, there's a lot of hope even in the middle of conflict, which is very inspiring and um, it leaves all of us to be... Um, as resilient as you are. Thank you. Thank you. 
All right. Well, thank you all so much for these great questions. Um, we appreciate how much engagement there was on this topic. It's obviously quite uh, interesting and we have a couple more, but unfortunately we have to wrap it up so that we can do member updates. Um, I just want to say a huge thank you to Aliana and Shirley for being here and for, you know, engaging such a great um, discussion around this topic. Um, we could probably have a follow-up <laughs> on this with how much interest there was. So uh, thank you so much for your time. And um, you guys, you and Shirley don't have to stay on since we'll just be doing member updates after this point, but we really appreciate having you here. This was a great topic. So thank you so much for your, your expertise. Thank you. Right. Thank Thanks you for so having well. us. Yeah, thank you for having us. Bye, everyone. Have a good rest of the Bye. day. Bye. Thank you. Bye-bye. All right. Um, Faith, would you like to lead? I know you had a few things that you wanted to mention in terms of um, upcoming events and things like that to mention for our members. And um, so we can go ahead and get started on that if you'd like. Yeah, uh, thank you. Thank you for, for the meeting and for the presentations. Yes, so in terms of uh, the updates, we have uh, several from uh, United for Global Mental Health. Uh, for example, we launched the, the communications working group last year, and we had several capacity building sessions, including developing communication strategy that involve audiences and, and our audience segmentation. So this year, I would like to review that adaptable communication strategy and transform it into a demand product. So we are calling all of you, you can do, give uh, feedback onto that product. Yeah, I would like it to be a useful, a useful guide where partners can utilize it to develop effective communication strategies that clearly analyze their audiences, help them develop smart messages, as well as evaluating the outcomes of our communication uh, strategy. So this document is going to be available on, uh, on the communications working group um, on, on, on GMAN. So, please uh, make sure you give us your, your input and then we'll acknowledge your contribution. Among some of the coming activities for the communications working group, we plan for the April session to be about media engagement and it will have uh, speakers from the media as well as organizations that are working together with journalists to improve reporting on, on mental health. At United, we'll also host two media roundtables that will be in, in May around a Mental Health Action Day and in September around World Society Prevention Day. So some general updates from United for Global Mental Health. Our impact report for 2023 is available and ready. We'll share a link to it in the in the chat. It highlights our our, our how we're advancing global and national mental health advocacy, and of course, our collective results and how we have worked with partners to have significant achievements in the mental health landscape. We're also participating in different uh, global moments and we'll usually utilize these meetings to discuss uh, communications approaches to upcoming uh, global moments. For example, we know this year we'll be participating in the World Health Assembly, ISA 2024, where we have a dialogue on mental health and HIV and the donor session. Uh, World Mental Health Day itself, where we're pushing for youth mental health as the theme. Uh, so again, I'll also share a link to some of the key global moments that we have. And if you have noted joined the communications working group, please do so that we can keep in touch. Yeah, I have my colleagues and Tony and Joe and uh, others from United in case there's anything that they would want to share with the group in terms of key updates. Yes. We can also jump in now. Hello, I don't have much to add. Uh, thanks for that, Faith, and also a really excellent uh, webinar. Uh, yeah, the other thing is that we'll want to engage the, the group maybe in the coming a month or so or a couple of months in also uh, co-producing our strategy for the network for the next few years. So uh, please look out for uh, an update on that.
Thanks, and turn it over to Holly. Um, thank you. I I really don't have a ton to update on. Um, like I said last time, and like we were talking about uh, prior to this meeting, um, I guess the big things we're working on are getting abstracts prepared for the International AIDS Conference, which is coming up um, in July. So that's been something exciting for our team. Um, I also want to mention that on the Strong Minds update side, um, since I'm no longer there, but I'm still providing some updates for their team, they have hired someone for the media and engagement role over there, which is um, my, my old position. So if you have any collaboration opportunities or, you know, projects you want to work on, I'm encouraging um, their new media engagement manager to join our communication sessions. But in the meantime, um, while he's getting onboarded, um, I think he's kind of pretty busy right now, but he wants to start joining the sessions moving forward. Um, so yes, they're very excited to have him on board. He has a wonderful background um, and he'll bring a lot to the team in terms of advocacy and communications. He also has a background, I believe, working with um, the UN and doing some work with mental health services for advocacy there. So hopefully he'll be able to join some of our next sessions, but um, I know they still want to continue to be involved in that way. Those are my, my big updates. Thank you. Deborah, if you want to jump in or if you want to add your, any updates you may have about um, either your personal work or Mental Health Cafe, feel free to jump in or you can add those to the chat as well. Yeah, no, thanks so much, Holly. So nothing major right now for me to report. I think a lot of things are still cooking for Mental Health Cafe, but as soon as we have um, more updates or opportunities for individuals to collaborate with us, we will make sure to let the group know. But for now, we're just, we're just pushing through. So yeah, but thank you. Okay, thank you for the updates. Um, do, does anyone on the team have updates they want to share or any upcoming events or webinars or anything like that that um, we'd like the group to be aware of? Feel free to either drop it in the chat or if you um, if you put your hand up, I'll hopefully see you. I'm scrolling through right now. Um, and you can feel free to to share that. Sorry, I'm trying to look for where I can raise my hand. I can't find it. Uh, can I say something? Yes, of course. Yeah, don't worry yeah. about putting your hand up. That's fine. Feel free to just jump in. Okay, the, okay so my name is Zipora Ali. I'm a palliative care uh, physician. I am on the board of the Kenya Hospices and Palliative Care Association. None of the things we are now uh, tr uh, trying to really get involved in as an association is to uh, empower uh, healthcare providers on uh, identifying mental health issues in people with life-threatening illnesses or chronic disease because um, most of the time people are focused on uh, other things other than mental health. And so this is something we ventured in a lot last year, but I'll keep you updated in case we have any updates I'll be able to share. But we are hoping that we can also uh, uh, you know, uh, uh, learn from the resources available on, on this platform to help us understand how it, we can integrate mental health into uh, palliative care and end of life care as well. Thank you. Great. Thank you so much for that update. Um, appreciate that. Anything else um, that anyone would like to share with the group? Or any also any ideas for um, you know, the next meeting? We always welcome that too. So feel free to just either let me know, you can feel free to email me if you have any ideas for future topics you'd like us to cover um, or areas you just think we could do a better job of um, speaking about communications, tips, resources, anything like that that you'd like. Um, we also welcome that. Oh, I see Deborah's hand is up. Yes, Holly, thank you so much. I forgot to mention this, but just putting this out there to the group. If you are on the call or you know someone who is um, experienced or, you know, would just be willing to share their own thoughts and expertise on the topic of faith, peace and mental health. So, again, there is that similarity with the individuals that we had speak today. So we're mostly looking at the intersection between faith peace and mental health so if you are such a person or you know someone who might be um you know relevant to this space please please i'll put my email in the chat please do reach out and i can provide more information um about this potential opportunity but thank you so much 
Great. Thank you. Thank you, Deborah. I appreciate that. It did look like we have a physical hand up. Dr. Spirit Clanton, um, would hey. you like to wrap this up in the last couple uh, minutes? Yeah, I just mm -hmm. a quick question. I was wondering, I'm new to the group. So hello, everybody. And thank you. Today was awesome. Um, but to that point, as a new member, I was wondering, do you all have like a welcome email or a link or somewhere that we might be able to go to as new members that kind of have like some maybe frequently asked questions about like what to expect as we um, join the group, how we can help or get involved? Like, is there somewhere that may already exist um, so that we don't just kind of come in and blindly try to figure out how to how to fit somewhere? So I think that's a great suggestion. Um, we do on the circle have a section that's specifically for the communications working groups. So we do have one, you know, that's for our team. There's one for the finance working group and it does have resources on there that can be helpful. It, we usually try to put, you know, agendas on there. This group in particular is relatively new. Um, we just restarted it last year. So we are kind of learning a little bit right now and um, probably getting it more organized. But I think that's that's a great suggestion. Maybe having some sort of onboarding email or something like that that we send out would help people know what resources are available. So I, I think that's a great suggestion. But just yeah. for you and as I, a new it's member. It's great to know. It's great to know that you guys are new too. Then I don't feel like the odd man out. Like, <laughs> should I come in or, you know, am I messing something up as a new member? <laughs> Absolutely not. No. And we are, like I said, we're completely open to suggestions because we are so new. So, um, and I think that's actually a great one just to say, hey, maybe we could do something more with onboarding so that people kind of have a path for getting to know how the communications working group works and what's available. Um, but yes, just for your reference, um, once you're on the circle, there is a section for communications that you can kind of look through. Um, and there are other sections on there that are pretty helpful too. Like the news section is quite helpful. Um, all of the working groups tend to share there. So um, yeah, I think that okay. those are some good places to look if you want some resources. Awesome. Thanks. And Holly, just Hello to add everyone. what you just said, um, again, really great point. So on Circle also, there is an about section under this particular working group where you can get more information about what the group is about. Again, it's it's not anything crazy. It's pretty general overview um, about what we stand for, what we're trying to do, what the mission is for this particular working group. So you do have access to that. We also have some of the past um, recordings um, for previous sessions that we've had also on Circle under our working group. We are working hard to get as many as we've had up there as well as other resources as well so that should be updated hopefully very very soon but again really great point about the FAQs we'll do our best to also have that on there um, and make sure there's a, there's a proper pipeline for individuals signing up to get in an email to join in circle and all of that fun stuff but thank you for your suggestion awesome thank you great well um, I know it's about 10 o'clock now, so it's about time for us to wrap up. So uh, this worked out well. I just want to say thank you to everyone for being a part of this. Um, I think all the questions and commentary made this a really engaging session. So I really appreciate everyone for being here um, and for asking all of these great questions and just putting your voices out there. If there's anything else I can help with, um, I, I did put my contact information in there. And like I said, I do work directly with Aliana or, um, and Shirley. So if there's anything that's pressing and you work in an area where, you know, there is conflict and you really need emergency help or something like that, um, we could try to provide some resources for you. So thank you again for everyone for your time. Um, Faith or Deborah, is there anything you want to add before we, we wrap it up? No, thank you so much, Holly, for chairing the meeting. And uh, thank you, everybody who has joined. I hope you've been able to have access to the different uh, links that we have shared and please do get in touch if you have any further updates. Thanks yeah, everyone. Have a great day. Bye. Thanks, Bye. Okay. Bye. Bye.